Tonight you are being treated to a very special evening as thriller writer and international best bestseller Lee Child takes the stage for a conversation hosted by Doug Stanton. Doug is the author of two New York Times bestsellers, In Harm's Way and Horse Soldiers, and his writing has appeared in Esquire, The New York Times, Time, The Washington Post, and many other national publications. His book, Horse Soldiers, spent over three months on the New York Times bestseller list, reaching number two, and is currently in development as a movie by Jerry Bruckheimer Films. A Traverse City native, Stanton attended Interlock and Arts Academy and still lives here with his wife, Anne, and their children. And by the way, as Doug mentioned earlier, and I think it is worthy of saying again, he is a huge Jack Reacher fan. So, thriller writer and international bestseller Lee Child has an interesting and impressive biography, and I would like to share a few facts about that biography with you. He won a scholarship to the same high school that J.R.R. Tolkien attended. Pretty cool. During his 18-year tenure as a presentation director for British television, his company was responsible for Brideshead Revisited, The Jewel in the Crown, Prime Suspect, and Cracker. He has an apartment in Manhattan and a country house in the south of France, and uh, he's a Yankee fan. <laughs> he also drives a Jaguar, which he assured us today he has never driven faster than 110 miles per hour. <laughs> His first novel, The Killing Floor, won the Anthony Award and the Barry Award for Best First Mystery. He is the author of 16 Jack Reacher novels, including the New York Times bestsellers Persuader, The Enemy, One Shot, and The Hard Way. And he is the author of the number one bestsellers, The Affair, Worth Dying For, 61 Hours, Gone Tomorrow, Bad Luck and Trouble, and Nothing to Lose. He gave us Jack Reacher, the cool-headed drifter with ice blue eyes, no driver's license, and who loves the blues. And just recently, it was revealed that Tom Cruise would play his character, Jack Reacher, in a Hollywood film adaptation, which he tells us is a good thing. <laughs> he has been called the best thriller writer in the business. He is touring in the UK. He is touring in Ireland. He is touring in the United States. And tonight, he is right here in Traverse City, so ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Lee Child and Doug Stanton to the stage. The entire population of the town is here. That's cool. <laughs> Did you notice the music you had on the intro? Uh huh. Johnny, really... be good. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Okay, we'll talk yeah. about that. We won't talk about the Yankees and Tom Cruise, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always start out by saying thank you very much for coming when I know that you have better things to do. You could be eating dinner. You could be watching the Tigers play their version of baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I would say see you in the postseason, but I don't think there's any chance of that. <laughs> Lee, we usually start a little warmer and then we... I'm a guy who created Jack Reacher. You think I'm scared of 800 people? <laughs> no way. Bring them on. <laughs> um, your newest book, Wanted Man, um, right here. Would you sign this for me? Yeah. I, actually, you can just sign the cover page there. OK. Um, and he'll do this for you after the show, by the way, in the lobby, if you, if you choose to. Thank you. Um, tell us about this book a bit, uh, because it just, I saw you on CBS this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great segment. And uh, you were talking about the Reacher myth and who Jack Reacher was in American culture. 
so what happens in a, in a, in a wanted man? Well, to talk about a wanted man, you've got to go back and talk about the previous three books. And the last book was called The Affair, and you ignore that completely, because that was a prequel out of sequence. It was about 1997 when Richard was getting out of the army. So forget The Affair, forget last year's book. Go back to the one before that, Worth Dying For, and the one before that, 61 Hours. And I was writing 61 Hours, and uh, Reacher is stuck in a snowstorm in South Dakota. And the problem with being stuck in a snowstorm is nobody can get in or out of town, so you're limited with your number of characters. And Reacher needed some information, so he called on the phone to his old unit back in, in Virginia near DC and spoke to the new commanding officer, the woman that had Reacher's old job. And he became fascinated by her because she has this great voice. Uh, he was just obsessed with her because of the voice and started picturing her. And his intention was as soon as he was out of the snowstorm, he would go to Virginia to meet her. And so in Worth Dying For, he set out for Virginia, but he didn't make it because he got hung up in a, with a problem in Nebraska. So the beginning of A Wanted Man, I mm. assumed that this, the book everybody wants is for him to get to Virginia and meet this woman and we'll see what happens. And unfortunately, this is not that book. <laughs> because as a, as a writer, what I have is no plan at all. I don't plan, I don't outline, I just start out and see what happens. And writers have this terrible habit, fiction writers anyway. See, Doug and I have been talking all day. He, Doug is, is saddled with the problem of being a non-fiction writer. He has to deal with facts and reality. <laughs> I don't. So what I, I just let my imagination run wild. So I assume I sat down to write this book and I thought, all right, he's going to get to Virginia and the story is going to be in Virginia. And uh, so how does he get there? Well, it's Nebraska. It's midnight. Obviously, he hitchhikes. So I, I started him out at the side of the road hitchhiking and I thought, yeah, but what if? What if he gets into the wrong car? What if he's in a car and uh, it's 80 miles an hour on the interstate? And within about 30 minutes, he realizes that everybody in the car is lying to him. And what if there's a police roadblock? And what if it just keeps getting worse and worse? That's how I would, my mind was working, and that's the story I wrote. So un unfortunately, he does not get to Virginia in this book. He doesn't meet the woman. But I promise you, next year, <laughs> I've already got the title. It's called Never Go Back. And next year, I haven't started writing the book yet, so I can't like 100% promise it, but my intention, <laughs> my intention is he will get to Virginia and meet the woman n this time next year. And uh, hopefully, if I come back, we can talk about it. What if she's moved? Well, yeah, this is the problem. Um, <laughs> what, if she's, what if she's dead? Um, <laughs> what if she wasn't a woman at all? <laughs> it, you know, it's, they only made contact on the phone, and it can be confusing. I just bought a new sofa, and I was speaking on the phone to the person at the store, to this young man, and uh, you know, in the end, I wanted to get his name so that I could know who I'd been talking to in case there was a hassle, so I said, could you tell me your name? And he said, Linda. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't tell on the phone. <laughs> You've said that, you know, you, you speak really clearly and fast, in a fascinating fashion about how to write books. In fact, today with the high school students, you were talking. But it seems you've just explained something, which is uh, writing thrillers is a series of what ifs. And um, I want to ask you, all those what ifs, did they occur to you in a morning? You take us through the, your uh, daily life in the creator of Jack Reacher in New York City um, in your office. Well, I have one inflexible motto, which is that nothing of value is ever achieved in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, I started out working in, in television, as, as Jill said, and that was a 24-7 job where I was one of five people rotating around the clock, and sometimes I would have to work all night, sometimes start very early, sometimes finish very late. And uh, so I decided, to, when I became a writer, the one luxury I would allow myself was to start whenever I damn well pleased. And so typically I get up at 10.30 or 11 o'clock, 
And I start work at around 12.30, something like that, and I typically work five or six hours. Um, <clears throat> it depends whether it's baseball season or not. If I have to be finished for first pitch if there's a game on. Otherwise, I might carry on a little bit later. And later in the book, I might go back to it at midnight and do two or three hours. But it's an it's a, it's a afternoon and evening thing for me. And it is purely linear. I have no plan, no concept. Occasionally, I have a vague idea of the thing or, or the surprise or sometimes a line of dialogue or something like that. I have a vague idea I might be aiming in that certain direction. But basically, I just like life itself. You don't know what's going to happen next. I start at the beginning and, and see what shows up. And because I do that because it's important to me to feel as a writer what I really hope you will feel as a reader, which is I really want you to be excited to find out what happens next. And I want to feel that while I'm writing it. So if I don't know, I mean, I get up in the morning or, you know, get up late in the morning and I want to, I'm just excited. I mean, what's going to happen next? Uh, I, I don't know at that point and I want to sit there and find out. Hmm. Um. I want to read to you the first maybe two paragraphs of, um, of Lee's uh, very first novel, Killing Floor, which is, while you don't have to begin in order with his Jack Reacher series, The Wanted Man is number 17 um, in the series, and you're 39 years old. You've recently um, been fired from a job you loved, and I learned something fascinating today by talking to him, but I just want to read this paragraph, because <clears throat> I really think it's... Um, it's great writing. I was arrested in Eno's diner at 12 o'clock. I was eating eggs and drinking coffee. A late breakfast, not lunch. I was wet and tired after a long walk in heavy rain, period, all the way from the highway to the edge of town, period. The diner was small but bright and clean, brand new, built to resemble a converted railroad car, narrow with a long lunch counter on one side and a kitchen bumped out back, booths lining the opposite wall, or do a doorway where the center <clears throat> booth would be. I was in a booth at a window reading somebody's abandoned newspaper about the campaign for a president I didn't vote for the last time and wasn't going to vote for this time. Outside, the rain had stopped, but the glass was still pebbled with bright drops. I saw the police cruiser pull into the gravel lot. I, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I can't stop reading. <laughs> And it's because of the sentence structure, the lyricism of your, of your voice, Lee. But what was so floored me today, tell us about how many lines of fiction you had written before you sat down to write those first two sentences. Uh, zero. That was, the, that was the first. The first paragraph is uh, unaltered from my first draft. And that was the first fiction I had ever written. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing because this is a. It, <laughs> while Killing Floor uh, would make a good movie, One Shot um, is the one coming out December 21st. But talk to us um, about where you were in your life and the composition of this book and, and how you went from television to becoming a writer. Well, it was, uh, it was forced on me, as you said. I mean, I had a job in television that. First of all, I started out in the theater and then very quickly switched to television, and it was a fantastic job. I mean, it was a, a, really a golden age. I was, um, I, I lucked into it. Uh, I was 22 years old, very quickly turned 23. Um, I was being trained for the job by a woman who was retiring, and she'd been there a long time. She knew everybody. And in my first week on the job, she said, uh, come on, we're going to have a picnic lunch with some actors who are in. And uh, this was Manchester, England. Uh, anybody who knows Manchester, England knows that it rains all the time. Therefore, the picnic was canceled and, and the lunch was moved inside. All the wicker picnic baskets were delivered to the studio floor and uh, we had lunch on the studio floor. And the actors were Laurence Olivier, John Gielgud, Ralph Richardson, and Alec Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> That was my introduction to that job, and it was a fabulous, fabulous job. And, you know, not, nothing to do with me personally, but it, it coincided with a glorious era of, of British television drama that uh, you might have seen on Masterpiece Theatre a lot. And the company I worked for probably, you know, made a, a good half of it. I mean, it was a fantastic, fantastic company, a great job. I loved it, and I would still be there today, except one day my boss said something to me 
that made it impossible for me to continue. He said, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, uh, you know, one of, those, one of those 1990s thing. British television had been very carefully regulated and structured so that the commercial channel, each commercial station had an effective monopoly in its, in its territory. Um, Manchester, England is Britain's third largest city. This would be, you know, like Chicago with one commercial television station. And of course, that was done way back in the 50s cautiously to prevent the so-called race to the bottom and the lowest common denominator. But of course, the result that it had was it became a license to make unlimited profit, which the government noticed way back in about 1961. And they put in place this regulatory structure that said they would allow profits up to an outrageous level. But if they pushed the profits up to an obscene level, the profits would essentially be confiscated by this thing called the levy. The levy was 100% tax above a certain level, which meant that the companies had a great incentive to spend that money on quality programming and very happily on my salary. <laughs> so we were doing fine and, and the product was really good. And then the Thatcher government decided that any kind of limit, Th Thatcher was fine with obscene profits, so she removed all this regulation. Uh, which tempted them to, to really push the envelope. And part of it was to get rid of the expensive staff. And by that point, of course, I was expensive. I'd been there a long time. I had benefits and a pension and all that kind of stuff. And so they started a two-year pro process to, uh, to bust up the industry and get rid of us. And the first thing, of course, they had to do was bust the union. And they did that by, or they thought they were going to do that, there was an old guy who was the uh, shop steward, the union organizer, and they left him alone, and they said as soon as he retires, then nobody should stand for election to replace him, because if they do, they will be fired within a week and never work in the industry again, which was a pretty heavy threat and a kind of effective threat, because nobody stood for election. And one day I saw this blank sheet of nominees and I thought, this is my real life reach a moment. I thought, this is not right. So I stood for election. And um, as soon as my name went up there, a manager came to see me and said, you're crazy. You know, we're going to fire you within a week and you'll never work again. And I said, we'll see about that. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> So I was elected unopposed, and uh, the one week turned into 117 weeks, uh, two years and three months before they finally got rid of me. And it was just guerrilla warfare. It was a bloodbath for, for, for the entire two years. Uh, I loved every minute of it. It was, I started out assuming that there would be some kind of rules or, you know, but they very quickly showed their hand that they were going to fight dirty. So I thought, all right, well, I'll show you what dirty fighting is. So I organized this SWAT team. I had cleaners. As soon as the management had left at the end of the day, I had the cleaners check every trash basket uh, for anything that looked like a draft of a memo or torn up. We, would, uh, we checked all the photocopiers for documents left under the thing. We, I had uh, engineers hacking into their computers. <laughs> when they figured that out and put keyboard locks on, I had the, the night engineers pull out the hard drives, take them home and copy them, bring them back. <laughs> we steamed open their mail. I knew everything that was going on. We, and I was the best informed shop steward ever. And along those, uh, the two years, you know, I won a lot of battles, but essentially lost the war. And eventually I took a vacation. I went to Spain for a week. And I got back from Spain and on my answering machine, the third message was, you're fired. Your key card has been canceled do not come back to work. And I have never been back. Uh, and that was the end of it. So then it left me with the, the I could not get another TV job, not that I really wanted one. Because I, you were blackballed, essentially? Yeah, I was essentially blacklisted. But I also figured that it was clear the industry was going to go down into a downward spiral, uh, which it has, essentially. Uh, you know, the quality of British television is very poor compared with what it used to be. So I didn't want to stay in the, in the business. So it was a question of, of what else could I do? And that was a problem, you know. I was very highly skilled at the job I'd been fired from, and that was all. I had no other real skills, and I thought, what shall I do? And then I thought, you know what? I'll write a book. I've read some, how hard can it be? <laughs> 
And, uh, but you'd read a lot of books. I had, actually. Yeah, that's underselling myself. I'd read yeah. a lot of books. I'd been a huge reader all my life. Um, you know, a passionate and committed reader. I, I taught myself to read at the age of three. My elder brother had already started school, and I was intensely jealous if he could do something that I couldn't do. So I, I, I listened in on my mother sort of coaching him after school and, and figured out how to read. And I, I read just obsessively ever since then. And so, and that was, that's the essential background for being a writer. There's no other way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there really isn't. You can't learn it. You can't, going to a class, I think, you know, like we did this afternoon, is, can give you a kind of shortcut here and there. It can clarify some things in one afternoon that might take you otherwise two or three years to figure out for yourself. But there's really no way of doing it other than to read, read, read. And I realized I'd done that part. And the other part that I suddenly realized was that, and this was like an epiphany, because if you do something all the time, and you always have, you really don't know that you're doing it. And I suddenly realized that the imaginative part of writing I had always done. The, you know, the Walter Mitty thing? Walter Mitty next to me looks like a completely normal person. <laughs> um, I mean, I have literally never driven my car. I never drive a car. I'm piloting a jet fighter. I, I never drive to the store. I'm driving to Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin to liberate a spy. You know, I just have always lived in a permanent fantasy world. And I suddenly realized, wait a minute, all you've got to do is write this stuff down. And uh, it's, it's a little harder than that because with daydreams, if it's not going well, you just abandon it and start another one. Uh, with a book, it's a big sustained effort for months. Uh, so it's harder than just daydreaming. But fundamentally, the process was already there. Did you have the Reacher character after hacking into the computers and copying the hard drives? Yeah. And it's a very Reacher-esque uh, uh, It is. Response. It's just, it, it was Reacher-esque in the sense that, you know, you mess with me, I'll mess with you back. And uh, that was very Reacher-ish. I mean, where he came from is, uh, I only really figured that out in retrospect, because I was experienced enough in terms of showbiz to know you cannot plan anything. You can't design it. You can't overthink it. If I had sat down and thought, and this was very important, you know, this was not a hobby, it was not um, a kind of like to do it sort of thing, it had to work. I had no other possibilities for earning a living. It had to work, otherwise my family would starve, we'd lose our home. Did your wife take a second job and your daughter a waitress to... They were brilliant about it, yeah. My wife was working part-time and she bumped up to full-time. Um, my daughter, who was 15, she went out and, and waitressed on a Sunday. And it was, uh, you know, frankly insignificant in terms of the mountainous debt that we had and the, and the cost of living that we had. But as a, as a gesture of support, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that just added yet more pressure. You know, I had, mm -hmm. to, I had to pay them back. So, but even, the, even though the pressure was enormous, you, I knew that you cannot think about it too much. You can't think, oh, shit, this is very important. So I need, you know, I need this. And I know that women... Um, read a lot of books, so I need to put woman stuff in, and I need to put, you know, guy stuff in. And as soon as you start designing it like that, you're lost. So what I did was just literally, metaphorically, close my eyes and and wrote what I wanted to write. And Reacher is what came out. And then I didn't want to break the spell by thinking about it too much, so I wrote the next one and the next one. And then a few books later, I thought, okay, I'm secure enough now to to think about it. And and clearly, you know, Reacher has to be the product of all the reading that I'd done before. And sure enough, he is. He is that historic character. He's an ancient character. He shows up at every period of history, in, in, in literally every culture that has a written narrative record. The mysterious stranger who shows up in the nick of time, solves a problem, and then moves on. That character obviously is very familiar to us from the Westerns in the US. But it's a historic character that has ex existed all over the place. Um, you know, me medieval Europe, Scandinavia, Anglo-Saxon Europe. It's, uh, it's a historic character. It exists in Japan, you know, the Ronin legends. Uh, every culture has this guy. And I sort of just produced a version of it. Mm -hmm. well, and to follow that up, I mean, what do you think Reacher is tapping into among this audience here this evening? And I mean, how do you account for his apocalypse? What is he speaking to in 2012? I think, uh, you know, all I can do is learn from what people tell me about that. And I think that it is a number of things. Number one, the, um, 
the, the lack of commitment, the footlooseness, the, the ability just, he owns nothing and therefore nothing owns him. He can just move on if he wants to. And I used to think that was a kind of guy fantasy that, you know, you, you wanted to just walk away from it all. But I've learned over the years it's also a woman's fantasy. They would love to just walk away from it all and be somewhere else tomorrow. There's that part of it. Uh, I think there's also the, a very strong identification with the character, especially amongst women. I've learned this, that, that Reacher actually has a very feminine sense of justice. Um, because in my experience, women are much more offended by injustice, plain and simple, than men are. Men seem able to just put up with it. But women get outraged. If something is not fair, they hate that. And uh, Reacher is exactly the same. You know, mm -hmm. Reacher is very feminine in that response. Reacher hates it if something is not fair, and he will put it right. And I think that narrative arc is appealing. I think always doing the right thing is appealing. We would like to be that person. So, uh, you know, that explains the popularity. The fact that he, you know, and he's got a lot in the, in the debit column. You know, he's dirty, he's smelly, he never changes his clothes. Um, well, no, he, he buy, I, I love it about him. He, he'll wear clothes for three days and then throw them away and buy new ones because it's cheaper than having a home to put the clothes in. I mean, right? I mean, yeah, and that was a very rigorous response to something that, that, you know, writing develops in fits and starts. And there were a couple of writers that you've probably, you've probably read, Sue Grafton and Sarah Paretsky. You know them? Mm -hmm. they, they started out a long time before me, and they kind of changed the genre in, in a certain way. That they, they moved it from what you could call fantasy or impressionist to a very realist genre. The, the, the heroines in those series were real people with real problems and real issues. They had houses, they had neighbors, sometimes their car broke down, sometimes their credit cards were maxed out. They ate, they got hungry, they cooked, they did all of those things, including they did laundry. And th th those series were so convincing in and of themselves that everybody who came after them had to deal with those issues. We have to have an explanation. What does he do about eating? What does he do about this? What does he do about that? And you can see that in all kinds of series. People are forever cooking now, you know. And some, some mysteries these days read like recipe books, you know. And uh, one of the things is, is clothes, you know. So, and I was aware of this kind of mental checklist. What is Reacher going to do about clothes? And I figured, well, obviously, what I would do is you buy new clothes every three or four days, you know, real cheap ones. And you just, right there in the changing cubicle at the store, you, you put the new ones on and you trash the old ones. I thought that was a rigorously logical approach. <laughs> and yet people seem like appalled by it. <laughs> And I have to say, it's a kind of American thing, you know, this idea that you can only, you've got to change every day and then shower every day. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like that in the past, you know, especially not in Europe. People would bathe once a week, probably, and change once a week, and they reproduced, you know, here I am. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it was obviously not that off-putting, but, uh, and I, I love that, you know, the fact that it was supposed to just be like, an easy solution to a detail, and everybody is, is completely fascinated about that. I, you know, people say, what about his underwear? <laughs> and I, I say, how do you know he wears any? <laughs> how is uh, working with Reacher now? So that, that um, epiphany in, was in 1995, and you published uh, Killing Floor in 97. Yeah, it was it, it, actually the end of, of 94, September the 1st, 94, I went and bought the, the paper and pencils. Sept si September si the 4th, 94, I started writing the book. So that, those lines were written on September the 4th, 1994. You bought $6 worth of pencils and paper. That's right. Who was the I, though? When you say I, um, I mean, who, who was that? It was that an unformed consciousness yet? I mean, was that really Reacher in full, or Lee Child speaking out of his own pain of being fired? It was very much speaking out of the rage, uh, and I think you can really see that in, in that book. You know, Killing Floor is an is a angry, violent book, and uh, it was. I was speaking, the rage that I felt at, uh, you know, not for my own personal situation, because I was, confident that I would find something to do, but there were hundreds of people involved. This was not just me, you know, mm -hmm. this was hundreds of people who had given, in some cases, their entire life, you know, their entire working life to building this thing up. And it was a cultural institution of great value and it was being trashed. 
and I felt very bad on their behalf. So there is a lot of rage and anger in that book. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was aware actually, the, the subsequent books, by the time you get to book number six, uh, which is called Without Fail, it, um, I felt that that book was quite cerebral and quite calm and so on. So, and I remember thinking, I gotta get back to, uh, you know, the old reacher. So for book seven, which is called Persuader, I did it again in first person, and Persuader is an absolute bloodbath from beginning to end. I thought, I, you know, I better it, get back into that. It's also the, the nickname of a, of a weapon, right? The yeah, persuader, yeah, that's where the title came from. The Mossberg makes a shotgun they call the Persuader. Mm -hmm. How is writing Reacher, I'm just wondering, how it's changed you over the sev 17 books? How have you grown? Or uh, you know, what, what one thing happened to me, which is that I, I had imagined up front that as I found something else to do and it took off or, you know, just after several years of doing something else, I would forget about the, uh, the old career, the, the anger at the end of that old career. And I absolutely haven't. Um, you know, as a writer, I'm, I'm just unbelievably fortunate, uh, you know, to, to, to get as successful as I've gotten as a writer is just, it's like winning the lottery on the same day that you get hit by lightning twice. It's, you know, it's, it's staggeringly unlikely. So I'm unbelievably fortunate. But that anger has not gone away one iota. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I woke up in the night, I was so angry. I must have been having some dream about it or something, and I was so furious, it woke me up. Mm -hmm. um, so that part of me hasn't changed much. Uh, the rest of it, you know, I haven't really changed much at all. One of the fun things about being a writer is that not only can you, but you kind of should do it later in life. And by that point, if you do get success, you are, you're already who you are. You know, your personality is fixed, your tastes are developed. It doesn't really alter you that much. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, probably a lot of people in this audience I know write, and so they're, I'm sure, glad to hear that you were 39 and you really do believe 40 onward. I mean, you, essentially at 40, you started a second life. Yeah, so, you know, and I, I do sincerely believe that about writing, that, um, that, and I felt a little bad this afternoon, you know, with, with the, the high school people, that that's too young. You, you can't, I think you can't write anything of meaning at that well, age. He also said there's no, he, um, he doesn't believe in revision while the teacher is <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't Giving a lecture about I, revision. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, you don't want to revise it, you know, do it once and do it right. What was the book, um, well, yeah, but talk about your, talk about your process for a moment. Um, you'll, you'll go back and you'll get up and, um, and you, and I read somewhere that you live on what? Coffee and? Coffee and cigarettes, that's what yeah. I live on. Yeah. And, um, and you have an appalling diet, you say. Yeah. yeah. You refuse to exercise. Yeah. yeah, I'm not, I don't take care of myself in any way. Uh, <laughs> And I kind of, I was asked about this in London uh, on the tour, a journalist, you know, was so strangely obsessed about it and um, was saying, but don't you worry about mortality? And I say, no, I don't worry about it. You know, it, it'll probably happen soon. I don't care. <laughs> what, um, it'll happen. I mean, this is the one thing we know for sure, right? We're going to die. We know that. And uh, he said, but it could be soon. And I said, yeah, it could be soon. You know, I might make it to 60, but I'll tell you what, my 60 years will have been a hell of a lot more fun than your 90, believe me. <laughs> that, was, that is my attitude. And, um, you know, with my luck, I probably will have lived to be 90. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, my process is I just, uh, you know, I, I get up late, I, I start work, and... Um, I was once on a panel, you know, you've done these, I know, these literary panels where there's four of you and you ask the same question. And, and for some reason, it was at a museum in New York. I was, it was a benefit charity thing and I was probably the rough trade or something because the other three guys w were, were very literary. And, um, and one of the questions asked was, if you could go back and change your first book, would you do it? And my first thought was, was of course, yeah, of course. I mean, there's always things in your first book that are terrible, you know, <laughs> kind of embarrassing. But by the time the answer got down to me, I'd changed my mind. I, I thought, no, actually, I wouldn't change it. Because the key thing is, suppose you were asked the question again in another five years' time, you would want to change it again. And you've got to just accept the fact that the book, that is who you were. 
the, the six months that you, you were writing it. It's like a photograph. It's like those photographs that we all have, you know, they're in a shoebox in the back of the closet from the 1970s with the, with the terrible hair and the awful clothes. That's who you were. You can't get around it. You can't deny it. And that is who I was when I wrote it. And I kind of take that to the extreme that I, the draft, the, the work I do today, that's who I am. And it's kind of dishonest, I feel, to go back a few months later and perfect it. You know, that's who I was. Mm -hmm. And so I, I write one draft and one draft only. And, um, you know, I have a sort of implicit bargain with my editor. I tell her she can make three points and I will listen to one of them. <laughs> who, who wrote this? This is a, it's kind of a test. It was to have been a quiet evening at home. Home is the busted flush, a 52-foot barge-type houseboat, slip F-18, Bahia Mar, Lauderdale. Home is where privacy is. Yeah, that's uh, John D. McDonald. Right. And a bonus point if you can tell me what the D stood for. Don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> the D stood for Dan, D-A-N-N, uh, which I believe was the, was the, the name of his um, maternal uh, grandfather who went hunting with Teddy Roosevelt. Wow. You've just won up me on my trivia question. There you go. <laughs> I tell you, I, I, I've got a very <laughs> trivial mind. <laughs> Do you have a photographic memory? Born in Sharon, Pennsylvania, yeah, okay. John D. MacDonald in 1916, July 21st, I think. And um, Oh, a cancer. Yeah, and he was, uh, <laughs> he volunteered for the army in, in 1940, ahead of the draft, ended up a lieutenant colonel. And I think the really interesting thing about him is actually that uh, his father, you know, Sharon, Pennsylvania was a satellite town near Pittsburgh and it was uh, precision metalworking. And the father was a financial executive for the, the uh, Savage Arms Company. You know, a really solid, prosperous, middle-class job. And MacDonald had a solid, prosperous, middle-class upbringing probably 30 or 40 years before that became common in America. And, th and so he was in the army, he served in, in, in military intelligence, he, he finished up a lieutenant colonel, and you would think, what would that guy do next? Solid middle class guy, he had a Harvard MBA that he got before the war, finished up a lieutenant colonel, what should he do? I mean, he should have come here actually and worked for General Motors or IBM, you know, that would have been the typical trajectory, but he didn't do any of that, he became a starving pulp writer. Uh, it's one of the great turnarounds, I think, in a person's biography. Tell us, tell, me, tell us who he is, I mean, and why he was important to you, because I bring it up because I think you were reading him at some point as yeah. inspiration. He yeah. wrote. he wrote a lot of books. He wrote, um, he was one of the, that generation that, that just wrote a lot, and uh, including 21 books in the Travis McGee series, which is, you know, like the Reacher series is a series, the Travis McGee series is probably overall probably the best ever um, suspense series ever written. And uh, you can go back to it now. There are certain things that you sort of cringe about a little bit. They were written early in the 60s, continued into the 70s, and they have a very, very old-fashioned view of gender relationships. Um, you know, if a woman is like really upset and traumatized, clearly the only available treatment is to have sex with Travis McGee. <laughs> <coughs> And, you know, maybe that, I've, t I've tried to have sex with traumatized women. It doesn't help them at all. <laughs> maybe it did back then. But the other thing about McDonald is he's a magician. And it's the, out of the 21 Travis McGee books, there's only one book, book. They all have colors in the title. And there's one book called Darker Than Amber. And in that book, something happens in the first scene, something dramatic. Uh, McGee and his friend are fishing at night uh, on a canal and a body is thrown off a bridge basically right into their boat. And that is the only, only excitement that ever happens early in one of those books. In, in the other 20, nothing happens. And yet, by page two, you cannot put the thing down. And it's very hard to understand how he's doing that. But I did start reading them uh, about five years before I started writing. 
I, I found them by accident. You know, they were famous here in the States. They were not famous in Britain. Uh, I'd been on holiday to Mexico. I was flying back through Miami, and I found one at the Miami airport bookstall and, and read it and loved it and then read all the others. And that was the moment that I, I began to see how it was done. There was mm -hmm. something about those books that I was loving the stories. They were great stories. But I, like on a parallel track, it was almost like the commentary track on a DVD. I could almost hear the author saying, this is why I'm doing this, this is why I'm doing that, hmm. this is what's gonna happen next, do you see what I'm doing here, I'm setting up this. And it, I suddenly started to think, okay, I see how this is done, maybe I could do it. Mm -hmm. It was like it was, you were going to school in a way, It'd be kind of a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. It or... really was, it was, like, it was like a textbook or like having a discussion one-to-one -one with the writer. Mm -hmm. Who do you read today that you would recommend to us? I mean, without bruising any friends' egos or... Oh, God, there's, a, there's so many uh, great writers. I mean, I, I even read nonfiction. You know, I've mm -hmm. read your book, actually. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, I read anything and everything. There is... It's I, all true, by the way, everything I write, yeah. I, I believe it is. <laughs> um, I read a book called The History of Air Conditioning in America. Um, <laughs> I read lots of stuff. I mean, right now I'm reading, uh, catching up with John Grisham, I'm, I'm reading The Litigators. Uh, I, I love John Grisham. I think, you know, everybody knows John Grisham. And yet, I think he's vastly underrated for what he is. He's, he's a very smart guy, very experimental storyteller. And he's worth studying, I think. If you, if you want to learn how to write suspense, he is really worth studying. He, especially one book he wrote called The Runaway Jury, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, because you have all these kind of rules. You're told these things that you've got to have. You know, you've got to have these characters that, that we care about, that we're invested in. And that book is like an experiment in getting rid of all that stuff. Because in Runaway Jury, there are bad guys and worse guys. Um, and there is nothing in that book other than the question, what is the verdict going to be in this legal case? And it's as simple as you can get, but you, the narrative engine is so powerful, you just want to get to that answer. Mm -hmm. And that taught me a lot, really, that, or clarified, I guess, what I love is when something is clarified, you, you've always kind of half known it, and then you suddenly realize the stark facts. And um, people talk all the time about creating suspense, and you've got to have this, and you've got to have you know, these characters that, that we care about, and they're in peril, and so on. And in my view, that, that's a very wrong-headed approach, because as, as soon as you say, how do you create suspense, you're kind of going down the wrong road. It, it's like the question, how do you bake a cake? And we all know or think we know how to bake a cake. You have to have some ingredients, and you have the implication that if the ingredients are high quality, the cake will be better. And you've got to mix up these ingredients with the implication that if you mix them really carefully, the cake will be better. And you put it in the oven, and if you get the temperature and the time exactly right, the cake will, will be better. But that's the wrong question with suspense. A better question is, how do you make your family hungry? And the answer to that is, you make them wait four hours for dinner. <laughs> it's that simple. And it's like that writing a suspense book. You start with a question, and then you do not answer it until the end of the book. It really is that simple. And, and reading something like Runaway Jury points that out to you. you know, th mm -hmm. That's all the guy does. He asks a question at the beginning, and he doesn't answer it until the end. And it is utterly compelling. Because humans are hardwired to want answers to questions. I mean, we really found that out in the in television business in the 1980s, because th there was something that nobody had in 1980 that everybody had in 1990, and it changed the business completely. And we had to learn out how to do with it. And now you see you're all in suspense. You're thinking, what was this thing? Because I've implied a question, I'm not answering it. You're thinking, what was this thing that we didn't have in 18, we did have in, in 90? And what it was, of course, was the remote control. Um, when I started, nobody had a remote control. If you wanted to change the channel, you actually had to get your ass off the sofa. <laughs> and that meant that we could rely on people actually not changing the channel very much. And then came the remote control, and they were changing it all the time. And so we developed this technique, which endures to this day, actually, especially in, in, in sports, in baseball particularly where you know what happens in baseball. Um, you know, around about the fourth inning, you know what the, re it looks like you, you know how the game is going. Um, so you're beginning to lose interest. So the, at the, after the top of the fourth, they ask a trivia question. 
and then you get the commercials, and then they answer it again. And that trivia question can be anything. You might, not, you might already know the answer. Uh, you might not care, but you want to know what the answer is. If you already know the answer, you want the gratification of having known the answer. <coughs> if you don't know the answer, you want it no matter what. And that is very fundamental, I think, in people. They want to know the answer. So you just ask them a question, they'll stick around. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of a question. Um, <laughs> um, uh, talk about uh, writer's block. You have an interesting, I think, perspective on, does it exist well, for you? Not for me. I think writer's block is, is one of those terribly indulgent prima donna things. I mean, I, and I do not in any way want to denigrate the, the joy and the, the creativity and the art and the craft that is in, in writing. Absolutely. I wouldn't denigrate that. In, in one iota, it, it is all of those things. But it is also a job. And you've got to treat it like a job. And th my mental comparison is, does a truck driver get truck driver's block? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer... The answer is, well, there are some days when he really doesn't feel like going to work, but he's got to because it's his job. So he climbs in the cab, he clips the seatbelt, he turns the key, he waits for the preheater light, it, comes, comes, it goes off, he starts the engine, he adjusts the mirror, the muscle memory then eases him into his day's work and off he goes. And it's exactly the same thing for a writer, it's a job. There are some days that you really don't feel like doing it, but you go down, you sit down, you boot up the computer, you pour yourself a cup of coffee, you light a cigarette, the muscle memory gets you into it. And so, no, I think writer's block is actually just a, it's an excuse, you know, it's, it's an excuse for, for people that actually don't have a deadline. You know, if mm -hmm. you've got a deadline, the best, if you've got a deadline and a, and a problem meeting it, the best cure ever is actually just go through your mail and make a pile of the bills. Uh, and <laughs> and that, <laughs> that gets you through it pretty quick. How did you know that when you have a truck, there's a preheater light? Because I, I, have, a, I have a little truck, actually, that has a preheater light. Yeah. You do? What kind yeah. of truck is it? Well, this is what very few people know, but my wife is from New York. And... Uh, We've been married a long time, and um, she's from New York. She hates New York. She, she loves England, which is where she met me, and I should have really gotten a clue, shouldn't I? She, she was in England. Uh, we were students together at the same university. I met her there. My lifelong ambition, ever since I was uh, literally four years old, my lifelong ambition was to live in New York City. <laughs> so I go to college, and I meet this woman from New York City. And, you know, my, I was not thinking entirely of the green card. Uh, she was, uh, I mean, it literally, all I can say about that, if, if this was a marriage of convenience, it really hasn't been very convenient. Uh, I, I wasn't totally thinking of the green, it was an added bonus. She was beautiful, she was smart. She was sexy, it was fantastic, but I just assumed as soon as we graduated, we would go back to New York. But of course, she was there doing her degree in England because she was an Anglophile. She loved the country. She refused to leave. And um, so she, eventually, she, I did persuade her, and, and we, did, we do live in New York now and have done for 15 years. But she was, uh, she still pines for England, and she said, can't we have a place in England? Can't we have a place in England? And so finally, I gave in. Last year, we bought a place in England. It's a kind of farm or a country estate. And so I have this Land Rover to mm. drive around my fields, and uh, it has a preheater light on it. Hmm. <laughs> it. Was that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I asked Lee. You asked me how did I know a truck yeah. has a preheater light? Yeah. Um, because you have, you know, both you and Reacher share, I think, an almost photographic ability to catalog a room. And I think that stylistically your sentences unfold in a series of photographs. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, and I think we've talked, but you're interested in how people do their job. And I think one of the attractions to Reacher is that he seems like a, a person of action, a competent person. And uh, you spoke today about the value of having a frontier and why, as a Brit, you chose to write a quintessentially American hero. And I thought, I wonder if you could speak about that for a moment. Yeah, because, you know, that character, the mysterious stranger, um, depends on a dangerous frontier. Otherwise, he's a meaningless character. And, you know, we're used to seeing him in the Westerns. The, you know, Zane Grey book is always the same. You know, there's a homestead. The men are mysteriously absent on a cattle drive, probably. The women and children are there in terrible peril. Everything is going to go really, really bad. A mysterious rider comes in off the range. In exchange for a woman-cooked meal, he will unsheath his rifle, take care of the problem, and then he rides off into the sunset. That's Zane Gray. Um, but that character has been there forever. You know, 500 years previously, that character was in Europe, when Europe was a big, empty, dangerous continent. And it was not a homestead back then. It was always a band of traveling pilgrims. They were traveling to, you know, Jerusalem or whatever. They were skirting the Black Forest or maybe going through the Black Forest. And they would be in terrible danger and everything was going to go really bad. And then at the last second, a mysterious knight rides out of the trees, takes care of the problem, and rides off the other way. And that character has always been there. And that is why Reacher has to be American, because that no longer works in Europe. It could work in Australia. Uh, it could work here. And the reason I chose here um, is the, the Willie Sutton answer, really. You know, Willie Sutton, the bank robber? was asked by the nascent FBI psychological profiling unit, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's true of the American, uh, that's true of the American readership. You know, people are, the truth of the matter is, Americans are a lot more literate than British people. And that comes as a surprise to a lot of Americans because they have this image of us Brits, they think that we are born already having read Jane Austen. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is nothing could be further from the truth. The, the last numbers I saw out of Britain, fully 60% of British adults had never read a book. Not just not read one since school, had never read a book. And Britain is also a very mean country in terms of, a very inhibited country in terms of, of spending money on somebody else's recommendation. You know, what happens in America is that, first of all, people read a lot more. Secondly, they're very adventurous about what they'll, they'll give a new guy a chance, and they will listen to the people in the bookstore. You know, you guys go into a bookstore and you say, what's good, what should I read? And the bookstore person says, try this. And you plunk down 25 bucks and, and you try it. Well, that whole thing would be just appallingly, toe-curlingly embarrassing in Britain. You know, nobody wants to advise somebody else to spend their money. So that whole system wouldn't work. And then you read the book, you come back and you say, that, that was awful, you know, what were you thinking? Give me something else. Or you come back and say, yeah, that was great. What else should I read? That dynamic is fantastic in America. And it, it means that uh, for, for a new writer starting out, this was the place to do it. You, don't, you have very little chance in Britain of, of ever get, catching the wave like that. Hmm. Talk a moment about the, your thoughts on the difference between popular fiction and, quote, literary fiction. You have some interesting things to say. Um. Well, to put it in a nutshell, I think that uh, there's a topsy-turvy misconception. You know, People think that it is somehow harder to write literary fiction. And uh, my question to that is, why? Why is it harder to write something that appeals to very few people? <laughs> uh, uh, Um, you know, they say that to you. They say, oh, you write best-selling popular fiction. And I say, yeah, and you sell worst-selling unpopular fiction. <laughs> uh, to me, clearly, if you, write, if, you, if you write something that pleases a large number of people, that is harder than pleasing a small number of people. Yet everybody seems to believe the opposite. And they also seem to believe, and this really drives me crazy, they also seem to think that literary fiction is the mainstream, and we've got all these kind of bastard children on the outside 
uh, you know, thrillers, romance, and all that kind of stuff. And again, that's completely reversed from reality. My guess is that thriller fiction was the original fiction. And I'm talking, you know, 100,000 years ago when we were cavemen. What kind of stories did we tell each other? We must have, there, was, there had to be a purpose for them back then, because 100,000 years ago, we did nothing without purpose. We had no leisure, we had no recreation. It was all a desperate struggle for survival against very long odds in very dangerous environments. And whatever we did had to produce the, a greater likelihood of being alive tomorrow. So in what way could stories help you be alive tomorrow? And clearly, the only way that they could is if they embolden you and encourage you somehow, make you a little stronger. Maybe stories about somebody who was attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, but escaped. So that you think, oh, okay, it's possible. You know, you can go to the edge of the cliff. You don't have to fall off. You can survive. Then maybe that story evolved into you were chased by a saber-toothed tiger. You turned around and killed it. There's Jack Reacher right there. That's the origin of Reacher right there. Um, people felt encouraged. Yeah, we can survive. So in my opinion, thriller fiction is the fiction. And the rest of it is, I call it, the barnacles on our boat. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and they are, almost literally. Publishing companies would not exist without without best-selling fiction. Bookstores would not exist without best-selling fiction. Something has to pay the bills. Those guys, are perfectly welcome to let them ride along with us. Just don't talk to me. <laughs> so, if we had a phone right here and we called up uh, someone in the UK, and I said, Lee, I want you to explain to this person uh, in Britain um, what America is like today in, two th in, in this month in 2000. What would you say? What, what do you think is the American story today that... Today, this month, right now, uh, it's, got, it's the election. I mean, the election, I think, is, is indicative of a lot of things that people, uh, you know, people would be surprised about, people need to get to know better. And, um, you know, I think the U.S. presidential election is pretty much a global event. Everybody's interested in it. Everybody follows it. But I wish they could follow it in the detail that we follow it in because I think it is, is very illuminating. Mm -hmm. what, what, but if you were to step back a moment, um, what's the lar I mean, you write a, a quintessentially American character. Um, how did 9-11 change the Reacher series, for instance? I mean... It's harder for him to move undetected now, probably, through the United States. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, there are details like that. But, you know, thinking back on it, it's, it's now um, 11 years ago. Uh, it almost finished the Reacher series in, that, in, in the sense that I was, um, you know, I had been in, in, in fiction, essentially, all my life. Uh, you know, everything about me was, it was about fictional narrative. It's the only job I'd ever had. It's the only stuff I've ever, I've ever done, and it's real to me. You know, the fictional narrative arc was kind of real to me. And what should have happened, and, and, and this is tied in with baseball. I hate to trivialize <coughs> this, but it, it's, it's tied in with baseball. If you remember what happened that fall, 9-11 happened. Everything came to a stop for a couple of weeks. New York was just uh, devastated, you know, emotionally, physically, um, the absence of the Twin Towers was something that, uh, it was just horrible. You know, it was a hole in the skyline. It was like seeing your dear friend with their front teeth punched out. It was just horrible. And, uh, and then baseball started up again after a couple of weeks. Um, the New York Yankees made it to the World Series, remember that? Against mm -hmm. the Arizona Diamondbacks. And it was an up and down series. It was a very dramatic series. Um, they lost the first two games. They won the third game. Then games four and five were those miracle games where they were down to their last out. Remember, they were down to their last strike, two consecutive nights down to their last strike. And uh, they tied the game in both instances <coughs> with a home run and then had a walk-off win later. Then game six was a terrible blowout. For, we lost. 
then game seven happened. And what should have happened? Every fiber of my being knew that what should happen is that the Yankees should win game seven, win the World Series. New Yorkers would be, on the, you know, the Monday morning, New Yorkers would stand a little taller, walk a little straighter. Everything would be getting back to recovery. Uh, every fiber of my being thought that that's what should happen because that's what would happen. In any book or any movie, that's exactly what would happen. But it didn't happen. Uh, the Yankees lost. And, I mean, it's devastating to me any time the Yankees lose. <laughs> but on that particular, that particular night, it just utterly, utterly, dis it just temporarily paralyzed my faith in fiction. Um, you know, fiction hadn't worked. It hadn't helped. The right, the right thing had not happened. And uh, I was unable to work for... I just didn't feel like doing it for, for weeks, really. Hmm. Um, that, book, it was, what, that book I was currently doing, and that was the only book I've ever delivered late because I, I just couldn't get back to it. Hmm. You've said that writing is often a matter of wish fulfillment, and I think in that case it was an abated sense of wish fulfillment, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, any movie you've ever seen, that's exactly what would have happened, you know, inc including the details of that series, you know, the, the sort of win-lose, mm -hmm. win-lose thing all down to the last inning of the last game, and uh, it should have been the Yankees winning, and, and, and you, you can all picture the, the feeling of the next morning, you know, it would have been that little bit better, but it didn't work that way. Before I ask you to read a passage from A Wanted Man, I just want to ask you, I mean, why is it that women um, are, are such enormous readers of the Reacher series? It's counterintuitive at first. Um, they're, I mean, maybe we should ask them, but... Uh, <coughs> well, I, uh, I mean, women are, in, um, are the majority readers of everything. Uh, you know, let's be clear about that. If you're in the book trade, you understand that, that women buy more books than men, always but I'm perfectly happy to admit I've got more than my fair share, and I'm delighted about it. Why? I can only go on what they say, and uh, I was once doing an event on, on one of these tours in an Arizona bookstore where there were 120 people crammed into the bookstore, and they were all women. And I said, look, I'm not going to do my event. I'm, I'm not going to say a word. You're going to tell me. Why are you here? And, and they did, you know, people, got, people are very good at talking about books now because book clubs have been around for so long, people have got very sophisticated and analytical about it. And they told me four reasons. One, uh, even now in the 21st century, they find, women find it difficult to express anger in public. You know, an angry man is seen as assertive, an angry woman is seen as shrill. It's an issue for them, so they love to, to live outreach's anger. Point number two was the justice thing, that uh, you know, they want to see things mm -hmm. made right. Um, point number three was that Reacher himself likes and respects women, and all the, the women characters in the books are fully formed people. You know, they're not thriller bimbos that twist their ankle and need to be rescued. You know, they're just as tough as Reacher. And number four was they want to sleep with him. There were 120 there, really? Yeah. <laughs> there was one guy there, and the only reason he was there, he said, I said, why are you here? And he said, because he, he didn't want to let his wife be alone in a room with Richard. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us be alone just for a moment. Okay. Would you read a passage? We'd love to do that, and then we'll go to questions from I'm going to read two little bits, actually. These, I remember writing these little bits, and I really enjoyed writing them very much. And um, so I thought I would... I would read them. The first thing is where the FBI agent, Sorensen, uh, uh, she's chasing a clue about McDonald's. She's got to find which particular McDonald's franchise correlates to the code number she's found on a, on a till receipt. Sorensen got her information first, such as it was. There had been no real opposition from the McDonald's main office, no real secrecy obfuscation, just confusion and a certain amount of incompetence and a lot of whole music and phone tag. Eventually, she, she had ended up talking to a minimum wage server at the franchise in question, a burger flipper, on a wall phone probably. She could hear tile echo and raw fries being plunged into hot oil. She asked the server for his location. I'm in the kitchen, the boy said. <laughs> no, I mean, where is your restaurant? The boy didn't answer like he didn't know. 
like he didn't know how. Sorensen thought she could hear him chewing his lip. She thought he wanted to say, well, the restaurant is on the other side of the counter, you know, like from the kitchen. <laughs> she asked him, what is your mailing address? He said, mine. No, the restaurant's. <laughs> I don't know, I never mailed anything to the restaurant. <laughs> Where is it located? The restaurant? Yes, the restaurant. Just past Lacey's, you can't miss it. Where is Lacey's? Just past the Texaco. <laughs> on what road? Right here on Route 65. What's the name of the town you're in? I don't think it has a name. Unincorporated land? I don't know what that is. Okay, what's the nearest town with a name? Big town? We could start with that. That would be Kansas City, I guess, which is where she's calling from. So that didn't help. <laughs> And then the other part that I really, again, and all that just, you know, just, that just came absolutely, just, just happened. I really loved writing that. And the same, I think I wrote this on the same day. Again, dialogue that just happened. They are, um, they're looking for this McDonald's. They're on Route 65, which Route 65 in, in Missouri runs the entire length of the state, north to south, which is why it's not really helpful to say it's on Route 65. Del Fuenzo crept onward at maybe 20 miles an hour, not as hard as it looked. The yellow line in the center of the road showed up gray and kept them on course. There was some forward visibility, not much, but enough for 20 miles an hour. People could run faster. Still no Texaco, no Lacey's, no McDonald's. Or no McDonald's, no Lacey's, no Texaco, depending on what the order was going to be. <laughs> Reacher looked left and right as far as he could into the fields. They were dark and flat and empty, nothing to see. Not that he expected a neon sign saying, last terrorist hideout before the interstate. <laughs> But 12 or 40 people usually put on some kind of a show. Maybe the glow of an outhouse lamp around a warped door, or a lookout cigarette, or a locked car's alarm flashing gently on the dash, or the blue haze of an insomniac's television behind a badly drawn drape. But there was nothing. Del Fuenzo said, we must have gone wrong somewhere. Sorensen said, no, this is the right road. Are those website maps always accurate? Government GPS is always accurate. Reacher said, so make a note in case you have to talk to Quantico. Tell them Whiteman Air Force Base would be the best place to land. Talk to Quantico? You mean if we fail to get the job done and I'm the only survivor? Obviously, there's a number of po possible outcomes. And that's one of them. That's two of them. We might fail to get the job done with no survivors. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lee. I'm reminded in that passage of how funny Leecher, I mean, Reacher really yeah, is. Yeah, Reacher can be funny, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. He's a great sense of humor. Now listen, we have some microphones, I believe, in the audience. If we could bring the house lights up a bit. And um, we have people with those, and they'll come to you. And please stand and say your, your name, and so we can see you. And um, we'll try to get to everybody. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Nikola Zekic, and I'm a foreign exchange student from Montenegro in Southern Europe, and I'll be here for 10 months. And let's, let's ask something. Mr. Child, did you know that you are popular in countries of ex-Yugoslavia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Croatia, and those countries? And uh, how does it feel when you are internationally popular, popular among all the nations in the world? Well, thank you for the question, and I hope you're having a good time here in the U.S. You picked a good part to be in. Um, and just as a rather flippant aside, I have to say that I, we writers absolutely are grateful for the, the breakup of former countries like the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia because what those new countries do, the first thing they do is they establish a national soccer team. <laughs> the second thing they do is they establish their own publishing industry. And so whereas you used to have one deal for Yugoslavia, you now have many deals because as you say, there are many countries. Same with the Soviet Union, instead of being one Soviet Union deal, it is now you've got Estonia, you've got Latvia, you've got Ukraine, you've got all kinds of countries. So. Um, 
it bumps up the total of countries. And, and my total is currently 96 countries. And uh, it makes me feel great. You know, it makes me feel kind of weird, actually, that um, there, are, there are people that I will never know, never meet, couldn't communicate with at all, uh, but they're reading my books. And I, I've got one particular room in my, in my office where I, they send you a copy of every edition. That's, that's always in the contract. And I have one room that is, is full of, of those foreign editions. And some of them, I don't even know what country they are because I can't read them. Uh, you know, they are in strange alphabets and so on. And, um, uh, but I'll, I'll give you one tiny piece of trivia, trivial information. In the Cyrillic alphabet, that they use in places like Hungary or Bulgaria, uh, Lee Child looks like Anne Yanni. <laughs> that's, that's what it looks like graphically. And so I, in one shot the book, I have a TV reporter called Anne Yanni. And that's where that name comes from. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, interesting. You know, you should take a picture of that room and send it to the guy who fired you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I should take a picture of the Renoir on my wall and send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, just from the response of the Tom Cruise thing, I'm curious as to if you had a say in who would shoot and who would play Reacher and how you came up with Tom Cruise. <laughs> Okay, the Tom Cruise issue. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a, it's a, it's a very, very, uh, it's a very complex answer, so, uh, but I will tell you, because f- uh, what I've got to say, first of all, is I am absolutely thrilled and deeply grateful that anybody cares enough to have an opinion. I mean, it is absolutely a writer's dream to have written a character that people are so invested in that they become defensive of <laughs> when it comes to the movies. Uh, you know, I, lo- I, I am so grateful for that. I'm so happy that you care. Um, so the history of this deal is I had, I had total control, complete control, in as much as it was my choice whether to sell it or not sell it. <laughs> and I'm serious, that is the moment of total control. Um, where you, you, know, you either keep it or you don't. And I chose to sell it because I love the movies and I wanted to have one small thing of me in the world of movies. You know, I will go to my grave knowing I've contributed one small thing to the world of movies, which is a thrill for me. It's, you know, it's like you get one at bat in the major leagues, you're in the baseball encyclopedia forever. And it, it's kind of like that, so I wanted it to be a movie. And the deal was done seven years ago. And uh, we didn't really hear much about it. It was bubbling under. And I have to say, the guy that, the point man on the deal with the producer of the movie, Don Granger, is a huge, gigantic Reacher fan. Um, You know, he's just a total fan of the books. He knows everything about it. And he was basically biding his time. It would have been fine. He would have loved to do it straight away, but he was going to do it right if he could. So that's why it took so long. And then about, uh, about, I guess, two years ago now, the, the writer-director Christopher McQuarrie came on board. And Chris won an Oscar some years ago for writing The Usual Suspects. He's a great screenwriter. He was going to write it and direct it, which I was very happy about because, in my experience, a, a, you need a great script. You absolutely do. But you need somebody who will defend that script because movie making is not this you know, glorious creative process that we think it is. Movie making is really industrial crisis management day after day. Nothing works, everything goes wrong, it's all chaos, and normally the script is the first thing to be sacrificed. But because the director was also the writer, I knew that couldn't happen, the script would be defended. So I was very pleased about that. And so then they came to New York at one point and said, we, we want to cast Tom Cruise. And again, I take full responsibility. I had, no, I had no contractual veto. I had no contractual power. But this was now seven years on, and the Reacher series as books had gotten so big and so well known that it was going to be crucial to them what my opinion was. 
I, I knew that, I could sense that straight away. And I know that if I had said at that dinner, no, don't do this, I know they would not have done it. So it is entirely my responsibility. Uh, but I looked at it like this, that um, I looked at it in many ways, actually. I mean, from my point of view, uh, the books are the books. Uh, the books run on a track that's, that stretches behind me and stretches in front of me, and that is the main track of my life. The books are the books. And I, got, I get somewhat irritated or perplexed by the general public's view. And this is something that happens to every writer. I guarantee it. You're on a plane, the person next to you talks to you, they say, what do you do? You say you're a writer. Then inevitably, the next thing they say is, oh, have any of your books been made into movies? <laughs> As if a book is not good enough. As if a book is merely a chrysalis or a pupa and it's not valid, it doesn't really exist, it's not really there until it's been made into a movie as if it's a linear process, first the book, then the movie. And I don't see it that way at all. To me, the books are in the center of my vision, and anything else that happens is way off to the side. Uh, you know, it's a parallel thing that is in my peripheral vision. And so, to me, I was content with something that was gonna be not exactly like the book, and in fact, I wanted it to be not exactly like the book. I know what the book says, I've read the book. Um, you know, I know who did it. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to see the movie for any information or anything. I need to see the movie as somebody else's creative vision, somebody's version. And so my attitude was fairly relaxed about who the actor was going to be, especially in the realm of, of the physical description, because the truth of the matter is there are no big actors in Hollywood. There are simply none. The camera loves small people. And, you know, this discussion has now been going on for a year and a half, basically, since the news broke. And people are saying, what about this guy? What about that guy? And all kinds of guys they're talking about, some of whom are actually dead. Um, <laughs> some of whom are 97 years old. Uh, some of whom are really no bigger than Cruz. You know, cr the truth of the matter is that everything you know about an actor's height is a lie. Every, all the PR, all the Wikipedia, everything is a lie. It's untrue. The only people that know what size an actor is are the wardrobe mistresses, because they have to know to make the clothes fit. And the truth is, at the moment, in the, what you call A-list actors in Hollywood, the height spread between the tallest and the shortest is four inches. That's all it is. And um, the actors that you think are big are not big. People think Clint Eastwood is big. Clint Eastwood is not big. Uh, I was at Warner Brothers not long ago when we were having this discussion with a wardrobe mistress and she went in the back and 20 minutes later came out with the tweed jacket that Clint Eastwood had worn in Dirty Harry. Remember his costume in Dirty Harry? Gray flannel pants, tweed jacket. She said, try this on. I couldn't get it on. The arms were like this. Clint Eastwood is not a big guy. You think he's big because he sort of kind of looks big but he's not really. So I was really very open to whoever it was, and, I, and Cruz, is, um, Cruz is a strange blend of two things. On the outside, he's a global movie star, a celebrity, and all that kind of stuff. And on the inside, he is a character actor. He's a very technical character actor who respects the written word, who, who gets into a part through the script. He, he insists that the, the script writer is, is always on set, because he the, the script is his thing, you know. He's not there to play Tom Cruise, he's there to try and get into the part. And I felt, based on his previous performances, that we would be sacrificing the immediate visual identification of Reacher in the book to Reacher on the screen. They would be not similar, but in every other way, he, I felt he would nail the part. And uh, I've seen the movie, and he does nail the part. It's quite amazing. Uh, you, I guarantee that if you go and see the movie, you will, afterward, you will, you will do two things. You will believe that you have seen Reacher walk and talk, and you will turn around on the sidewalk, go back in, and watch it again, <laughs> back to back, because that's what I wanted to do. They flew me to Hollywood in a private plane, they showed me the movie, and then they were going to take me to dinner, which was very nice of them, but I was like, 
forget dinner, just show me the movie again. It was really, really good. And, um, you know, people that know Reacher and love Reacher are going to be weirded out for two or three minutes at the beginning. And then the it will suck you in, and at the end of it you will think, what was I worried about? So this is a re it's a really tough time for me because I've seen the movie, nobody else has seen it yet, till December 21st. And, you know, quite naturally, people are defensive. Reach, it belongs to you. Absolutely, I understand that. That's the way books work. Books are a two-way street. First you write them, then somebody reads them, then they exist. Uh, a book belongs to the reader 50-50. Not in terms of work put in, I may hasten to point out, but <laughs> in, terms of the, in terms of the imaginative creation, it's your imagination that creates the book just as much as mine. Therefore, you own Reacher. I completely understand that. And I, like I said, I'm deeply grateful that you're so defensive of him. But just stay calm. <laughs> Hang in there and watch the movie, and I think you will be amazed. Great, thank you. Beth, yeah? Uh, my name is uh, Larry Page, not the one that started Google, but I am. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions. One is I was I'm curious to know what your take is on uh, your fellow countryman, J.K. Rowling. Uh, okay. Her and imagination. Yep. And the second thing I was also curious about is w one of his fighting techniques is headbutting once in a while. Wouldn't that be just as hard on the butty as the butter? <laughs> <laughs> now, well, I'll answer the questions in reverse order. He um, headbutts are, are uh, you know, an arch is nature's strongest shape. The especially in a male, the bone on the front of your forehead is incredibly thick. Uh, believe me, you can do a, you, I mean, I've had butted lots of people. You do not feel a thing. Um, <laughs> and they sure do, believe me. J.K. Rowling, I met her, um, I met her once at an award show. We were both out in Britain. In Britain, they have televised book award shows, it's trying to make up for the fundamental illiteracy of the country. <laughs> and um, I met her there, and it, she, she was astonishing. I mean, uh, she, was, uh, I, she was waiting inside the back lobby, basically waiting for her limousine, and I was heading out the back lobby to have a cigarette. And so we, were, we met at very close quarters, and she, was, um, she, she looked luminous. She looked spotlit somehow, and uh, she, she looked as if she were floating just like half an inch off the floor. Uh, she's a very beautiful woman, and you got the sense that there was this immense and almost dangerous imagination behind her. Uh, I was totally fascinated by her, and um, I'll be very interested to, to read this new book uh, that's coming out in a couple of weeks, um, her first adult book. I, I'll, I'm, I'll be very interested to see what it's like. In the balcony? In the balcony, yes. Go ahead. Hi, I'm John. Um, I've noticed that your stylistically, your, your writing has changed from the early books to the later books. Uh, for example, in the, in the first books, you'll go through an entire paragraph where you never mention the subject of the sentence. I walked into the room, saw the TV was on, decided to make microwave popcorn, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the short story you just wrote for Ex Esquire magazine, Reacher isn't even the narrator. Uh, does changing the style keep it fresh for you, or are we literally watching the evolution of you leaving that job and you know, growing older than 39 years old. Uh, I think it is an evolution, yeah. I mean, the Esquire magazine was, uh, you know, just the thing about short stories is that th there's not that much writing on a short story, so you can afford to experiment. So that, you know, in the Esquire short story, yeah, the narrator is a woman cop and Reacher is the subject of investigation. I just thought that would be a fun way to do it. The evolution of the style, absolutely. I was very aware at the beginning that uh, you have to be distinctive in many different ways. You know, you've got to be, oh yeah, that guy. And so I needed to be as distinctive as possible and I remember making a very conscious decision to use that, uh, those short sentences, the sentence fragments, um, absolutely, in, in, a, in a way that was a sort of faux naïve style, um, as if this was a, an intelligent person but not 
used to communicating verbally very much, you know, reticent type of guy. Uh, so I, I laid it on very thick in that first book and the second book and so on. And then I felt that Reacher was established in people's minds after that, and so I could just breathe out a little bit and relax in the later books. And the later books, yeah, they've gotten a lot more fluid, a lot more uh, lyrical, a lot less choppy. So there has been an evolution of style, absolutely. Roger, yes, go ahead. Good evening. Hi there. Uh, I think the first novel I ever read cover to cover without illustrations was, was Shane. I was probably six or seven. At the time, I didn't know he was an archetype, the stranger that comes and fixes it and then leaves. As he leaves, the little boy is saying, Shane, come back, Shane, and I was crying. And then jump ahead about 50 years, and I'm, I'm sitting in bed with my, with my wife, we're both reading, and she tosses over one of your books. And I get into it, it's like I rediscovered Shane, and I want to thank you very much for that. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Randy. I'm just curious, do you own an alarm clock? Do I own a what? Do you own an alarm clock? Uh, absolutely not. No, I don't have an alarm <laughs> clock. I, uh, I have, um, I mean, that telling the time thing is, and waking yourself up, that was, it's a skill that I, is eroding in me because it's a long time since I used it, but, you know, that's all we had in live television was the time. And um, I, I, absolutely, I would know what time it was. I could... On a night shift, you know, I, could, I, I would doze a little bit and figure I need to be awake in 23 minutes and I would wake up. Uh, I would know duration of something. If we're paid for a 30-second commercial, they're not going to pay if it runs 29 seconds on air, so I was, got very good at, at durations. That, that was a real-life skill, but of course it's eroded badly now because I haven't had to use it for a long time. Hello, my name is Phyllis, and I'm wondering, we. We know Jack Reacher, or I feel I know Jack Reacher's mother well and his father not at all. How did you develop his parents? Yeah, that's the mother thing. I, I uh, you know, that was in, the, in book eight, essentially the enemy. And, um, and I felt it was, you know, time for one of those prequel books and I wanted to, uh, to some extent explain Reacher but I thought it would be kind of too boring and stereotyped, you know, if, if his dad had been, you know, his dad was this tough soldier, so Reacher was this tough soldier. I, I thought that was not, you know, not interesting enough, so I, I, I did it with the mother. You know, the mother is, is a surprising person with surprising things in her history, which I really, I really enjoyed, and, um, you know, the mother was, was dying as well, which I thought was... You know, that was a consequence of the decision in, in the first book that uh, because this character is a loner, it was essential for the, for the story that he was completely alone in the world. Uh, you know, people say, do I regret killing his brother? So, you know, his brother was killed before the, first, the series even started. Do I regret that? Well, in a way, kind of, because the brother was a very interesting counterpoint to Reacher. And, uh, but Reacher had to be completely alone. Otherwise, the narrative, think about it, you know, reach of the character would have made no sense if he'd had a brother he could call or a mother he could see or something like that. He had to be alone. So everybody had to be dead. And, uh, you know, the mother was dying in the enemy. And I, I really, the, you know, frankly, the, the mother dying in the enemy was really a, a coded message from me to my daughter. Um, you know, don't worry about it. People die. Get over it. Uh, you know, I, I, want, I wanted her to read that and, and, and think, well, you know, when, when my dad's time comes, he's kind of told me how to react about it. Um, I, I've never really had, for some reason, I've never really had a strong sense of who Reach's father is. And um, uh, I did put him in that short story, Second Son, uh, but even so, I still don't, you know, really feel that he's, he's very rounded in, in my mind. So if I ever sort of figure out who he was, maybe he'll, he'll show up in another prequel, but, um, you know, I, I'd like to think of Reacher and his mom, you know, I think that was the family unit. Hmm. Interesting. Let's take a few more here and then we'll... Yes, go ahead, Beth. Uh, My name's Dave. Uh, first of all, thank you for a beautiful evening sharing all this wonderful stuff. 
I always laugh out loud when I, when you, your, your method of explaining how you're going to dismantle the opponents. <laughs> Where in the world did you come up with that? Where well, there's three people, eight people, he systematically <laughs> defeats them before he, he, he raises a finger. That was genius. So thank you for that. How did you come up with it? Well, you know, that was, that's basically all written from, from earlier in my life when, uh, you know, that thing, there is never a five-on-one fight. Because um, if you hit the first three hard enough, the last two run away. Um, I learned that when I was, a, I was about eight. I, I really remember it well. My, uh, my, I grew up, and I really do not want to give a false impression uh, because, you know, my circumstances were, were really no worse than anybody else's, but it was a different time, uh, regrettably a long time ago that I was a kid. And it was just a different place, different time, a rough industrial city where violence was, was the instinctive recourse for everybody. And I well remember I fought practically every day because it was a rough sort of neighborhood, but I was a smart kid and therefore, you know, above myself, too big for my boots, and therefore a target. And uh, my parents were poor, but white collar, you know, white collar poor rather than blue collar poor. And that, that again was a, a kind of, um, you know, again, above my, uh, I was too posh for these kids. So every day was a fight. And I well remember my, my great aunt came up from London to visit us. And the deal was I was supposed to meet her and my mother at the library. And because it was, you know, respectable family back then, I was sent to school in clean clothes because I was going to be meeting my great aunt who hadn't seen me for years. So I was walking up to this library and you had to go up this alley. And in the alley were these five bully, bullies. I still remember the leader's, leader was called Douglas Cooper. I still remember him. And it was, you know, they were blocking the way, and it was uh, clearly going to be a fight. And I just thought, oh, God, I'll be late at the library, and I'm wearing clean clothes. <laughs> and this guy, Douglas Cooper, I just thought, I've got no time for this. So I, I just hit him as hard as I could, and then the next two, and the final two ran away. And that taught me a lesson. You know, you, you get your retaliation in first. Um, you, you know, let them know who you're dealing with. So all that, all that reach of fighting stuff is absolutely from the schoolyard when I was in elementary school. It, it absolutely is. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. My name is TJ. This question relates to your next book. As Reacher is heading toward Virginia, is there any chance he'll stop in Traverse City? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, this is, a, this is richer territory, this kind of a place, you know. He could come up here and, uh, you know, aim to get, get lost somewhere out in the wilds and just hang out, and uh, he'd probably have to come through here. And, uh, you know, the problem is all the pe people I've met here are so nice, you know. Where are the, um, <laughs> where are the bad guys? He likes the Yankees. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah Reacher, is a, <laughs> Reacher is also a Yankees fan, and... Uh, he can start some fights. Oh. One more pass and we'll be at it. Thank you. There we go. I'm Kathy Bays. This doesn't work, I don't it, think. It's, it's working. Um, I'm Kathy Bays and I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay. Oh, there you go. So I really want to know a couple of things. First, your, your um, stories are so detailed. I love Jack Reacher. One shot is set in Indiana. You never name the city. I know it's not Indianapolis, and I know it's not Bloomington. So if, you, if there is one in the movie, if there's a city in the movie, will you share that with us? Or if there isn't, tell me how you, what, how you came upon Indiana to write in that story. And the other thing about your detail is, where do you know, how do you know so much about guns? <laughs> Everything is. Well, the. Uh one shot is, is an unnamed city in Indiana, and I particularly wanted Indiana because it seemed to me to be, you know, it's a bellwether state in some ways. It's such a heartland state. It's, it's so kind of uh, characteristic, I think, of, of the middle part of America. But picture, it's not, um, it's not a real town at all. I was picturing in my mind uh, really Cincinnati, parts of Cincinnati, 
which I know is not in Indiana, but I... <laughs> I, I <laughs> Right. I, I just was, it was parts of Cincinnati, but I put it in, in, in Indiana just because that's where I wanted it to be. And, uh, you know, I do that a lot. And the, how do I know so much about guns? Well, it, generally speaking, I don't do any specific research, but in terms of detailed things, I think, for me anyway, cars, uh, if I'm reading something about uh, a car that is wrong, it just sticks out so badly. And I think guns are the same. And I, you know, I've noticed this repeatedly in books. You know, there was one book I read that was somebody was escaping in a Cadillac Eldorado, and um, you know, they bumped off the road into this field, and the, you know, the rear tires were spinning and throwing up great rooster tails of dirt, and it was slewing all over the place. And I'm thinking, an Eldorado is a front-wheel drive car. <laughs> if you get something wrong like that, it just sticks out. And I figured, yeah, guns are the same. So I do take. I do take care with, with the gun stuff. I either find out from a magazine or a book, because uh, if you make a mistake with a gun, then you get 10,000 emails <laughs> from Texas alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And ultimately, my, and, but people are really generous and they volunteer their, their help and assistance, and I was, I remember for, uh, for Echo Burning, which was the fifth book, um, I, I, I was sent on tour to Little Rock, Arkansas, because there was, there was a bookstore there that really wanted me to go. And typically when you get sent on tour, in each city you are met at the airport by what they call a media escort. And that is a person who knows the local media scene and knows all the bookstores and will drive you from place to place and facilitate the whole thing and then they drop you at the airport the next morning and off you go and you meet the next one. But little, and, and, and a big media market, let's say like LA, that is a professional job and many dozens of people are doing it. In a medium-sized place, let's say Milwaukee, um, there aren't many people doing it. It's probably the same kind of lady that would normally do real estate or something is, is doing that job. But in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is no kind of a media market, there were none of them. So my publisher hired a retired businessman, explained what he had to do, and uh, he was very willing to do it, and he met me at the airport. And he had the, the press kit, which was you know, the itinerary, the press release, and a copy of the book. And he said he'd read the book. And I thought, wow, that's very nice of you. He was called George. I said, that's really nice, George. Thank you very much. And he said he enjoyed it so much that he'd gone out and bought all the previous books and read them too. And I thought, George, that's fantastic. So we did the event, which was a Sunday afternoon event in Little Rock, and it finished at 5 o'clock. And he said afterwards, he said, do you want to come back to my place for a beer? And I thought, well, you know, it's five o'clock on a Sunday in Little Rock. What else am I going to do? <laughs> so I said, yeah, that's great, George, let's go. So we get back to his house, we walk in, and the dining room table is covered with guns. <laughs> and he said, this is every, one, every gun the Reacher has ever fired. <laughs> And I thought, who knows I'm here? <laughs> and I said, George, t I very much appreciate that you bought the books, but please don't tell me you got, went out and bought all the guns as well. <laughs> and he said, no, they're just from his collection. And he turned out, to, turned out to be a reasonably sane guy, and he had this immense collection, something like 30,000-piece collection of, of firearms and uh, all kinds of things. Uh, he had you know, those Al Capone, Tommy guns, five of them, mint condition. He had an 1873 Colt Peacemaker in mint condition with also uh, the same gun but a rusted out frame recovered from a stream. And the hammer was rusted in the back position, so, you know, it was obviously about to be fired when it went in the stream. Maybe some gunfighter was killed and, you know, they hauled the body out but the gun stayed. Fascinating stuff, and he said, "If you ever want to know anything about guns, just ask me." And he gave me like a freebie at the time to, you know, reel me in. And he, he, he pointed out there are two main manufacturers of revolvers in the U.S., as we know, Smith and Wesson and Colt. And he said, "Did you know the cylinders go around different directions depending on the manufacturer?" And absolutely, I didn't know that, but I put it straight in the next book, and <laughs> as if, you know, now, hey, I'm a, I'm a real expert.
But, you, you, you know, gun stuff you cannot win because I was talking to this guy in Britain who, uh, he's, he's a thriller writer now, but he used to be in the SAS, which is, you know, Britain's version of Delta Force. And at the time that he left, he was Britain's most decorated serving soldier. He'd done all kinds of things. You know, those, those special forces do all kinds of things that you don't even know about. Assassinations they do. This guy had literally assassinated people, uh, IRA people. They'd had a meeting in Gibraltar, which they thought was out of the way, on the end of a pier where they thought they could get away without video or audio surveillance, but the British intelligence knew that this was going to happen, and my, my friend's job was to saunter along this pier like a tourist and get within 10 feet of these two guys, pull out a gun, shoot them in the head, and then walk back, which he did. He's done this sort of stuff for real. And he told me he would never use an automatic pistol that had been loaded for a long time because he would fear that the spring had lost temper and it would misfire on the first reload. So I thought, cool. So I put that in the next book too. <laughs> and, um, and I get 10,000 emails from Texas saying, bullshit. My <laughs> My granddaddy's had a gun that was loaded for 50 years and it works just fine. <laughs> and so on the one hand, you've got this guy, the most decorated soldier in the British Army, and the other side, people who know better. So you cannot win. <laughs> yes, Roger, let's take a few more and then we'll go sign books. Hi, I'm Wally. And first of all, thank you very much for a very inspiring evening. Appreciate that. I know that you've mentioned a couple things uh, which... I appreciate, uh, among them, you said that uh, writers must be readers, which I totally agree with, and also uh, that, uh, you know, don't bother to revise, uh, which was one of your comments that you never do. I was wondering, considering all the things that you've talked about in your writing, what would be one or two of the things that you would advise aspiring writers to do? Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. It would not be the same without you. And, um, <laughs> you know, my advice for aspiring writers is ignore all advice. You, the one thing, I mean, there is no guarantee of success in this, in this business. It depends how you measure success. What do you want to, you know, what do you want to do? What is your definition of success? And if it is some kind of reasonable amount of acceptance or acclaim, then you have to, you get to the starting line, and what happens after that is all about luck and circumstance. But to get to the starting line, you have got to have a book that is a living, breathing, vital thing, a thing that's alive. It must have a heart and soul of its own. It must be organic. It must have integrity. And the only way that that can possibly happen is if it is the product of your imagination and yours alone. It must be exactly what you wanted to do, exactly, even if you're certain that other people wouldn't do it that way. Even if you're certain everybody else is going to hate it, you've got to do it exactly how you want to do it. Because if you do that, it will be a living, breathing thing. And if you like it, even though you're certain other people will hate it, actually they won't because it will have a spark and appeal of its own. And we're all individuals, but we're not that different from one another, so that if you like it, there will be a 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 other people that like it. If, on the other hand, you're sitting down there and you're thinking, well, you know, this is what I would really like to do, but Lee Child does it differently, and Stephen King says do it later in the book, and this other author says don't do it at all, as soon as you go down that road, you are lost, because then it is a dead product. Um, so my only advice to writers is ignore advice. Do what you're convinced is what you want to do. And that's what I did with the first Reacher book, you know. He, he does none of the things that a thriller, thriller hero should do. He lies, he cheats, he steals, he shoots people in the back, all kinds of things. Um, but he turned out okay. <laughs> all right. Our last question, and then we'll adjourn to the lobby. Thank you. I am Larry Potter, and that's not Harry, it's Larry. I just, I get that every time. Uh, Lee, you've talked about how you uh, just start writing 
and uh, just looking how you're going to finish a book and you're just excited how it's going to end as the rest of the readers. In 61 hours, when we got to the end of that story, you had Reacher down underneath this concrete. You got jet fuel coming down and all of a sudden the story just kind of ended and you kind of left the reader hanging there like, how to get out of there? And then, it, and then about a third of the way through the next book, you kind of went back and kind of explained a little bit. But did you get to an end of that story and couldn't end it, or is that? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> well, you know, that's a great question. And, and that was, was uh, you know, on balance, probably a failed experiment. And I'll tell you what I was trying to do, which is that um, I was aware of, of, of being a little bit too influenced by uh, what we used to have to do in television, which was, um, you see, the thing about television is that a long, long time ago, people stopped consuming it as what you might call a serial activity. You know, in other words, nobody sits anymore and just watches the television. Uh, it, it's become a parallel activity. In other words, people watch the television while they're on the phone to their mother, while they're cooking dinner. Uh, and so we developed a tactic in, in, in television. When you came up to a, an important plot point, first of all, you would tell them that you were going to tell them. Then you would tell them. Then you would tell them that you've told them. <laughs> it was because we had to take into account how people were consuming the product. So it was sort of labored. If you, you, know, you had to just explain it quite carefully because of the manner in which people were consuming it. And I felt maybe, possibly, I'd been t too influenced by that, spelling things out. So I thought for that book I would try something different, that I would, I would write that final scene and all the information is actually there. Everything that you need to know is spelled out in that chapter and several previous chapters. Everything that you need to know is there. And I thought, well, let's just leave it like that and, and let the reader do the work. Instead of me telling them you know, this is how he survived because of this and this and this. I thought, let's just leave it. And the information is there. The diligent reader can figure it out for himself. And uh, on balance, it was probably a mistake. I should have had the, you know, the usual chapter with, with him surviving it and walking away. But I thought, no, let's just leave it there and, and kind of throw the ball into the reader's court. Because like I said before, this is a two-way street. You know, I figured, let them help me out here. You know? <laughs> let them do some of the work. But I, uh, and it was done with the best of intentions, and um, I think it was probably a failed experiment, even though there was nothing missing. You know, the information was there. You could have figured it out if you'd worked hard enough. You could have figured it out. Um, it was screwed up completely in Britain, because unbeknownst to me, my British publisher put to be continued. <laughs> Um, at the end of that book, which was absolutely not the intention, um, which then dropped me right in it because I had to continue it then for the next book. But uh, it, yeah, it was not supposed to be like a gimmick, although I have to say it was the end of a contract, uh, that book. <laughs> and um, so there was a slight ulterior motive in that. You know, I never take anything for granted. Uh, the publishing industry is always in a mess. Uh, now it's in more of a mess than usual, and I never take it for granted that I'll get renewed. It was perfectly possible that would be the last Reacher book. So I was also trying to do it in a way that if it wasn't the la last Reacher book, that ending would work. If it was the last Reacher book, that ending would also work. And I also wanted it to be a kind of just a little nudge in the ribs to the publishers about renewing the contract. <laughs> uh, you know, if you've ever seen, have you ever seen Peter Pan in, in pantomime, uh, you know, Tinkerbell the fairy uh, is always represented by a little tiny beam of light and at one point it collapses and, and starts to dim and Peter Pan says, come on children, if you wish hard enough she'll come back to life. If you clap hard enough she'll come back to life. So the children all clap like crazy and sure enough the beam brightens up and she takes off again. And I was trying to say that to the publisher, you know, <laughs> you could, if you if you wish hard enough, Richard could come back to life. <laughs> if you clap hard enough, if you put enough zeros on that check, <laughs> Richard could come back. So there was a whole bunch of reasons, but ultimately I felt uh, it, it kind of should have worked. I don't quite understand why it didn't work, but it didn't work. I, I accept that. 
I want to leave you with this, and I'm going to ask you this question, and the audience can answer it by reading A Wanted Man. How can you talk for a minute without using the letter A? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, you see, that's again an example of my trivial mind. Um, I'm fascinated by stuff like that. You walk up to somebody, you do it in a bar, it's a great bar bet. You say, can you talk for a minute completely coherently at normal speed? And everybody says, yeah, I think so. so you, and then you say, can you talk for a minute coherently normal speed without using a word containing the letter A? And they say, no, that's impossible. But you can. And to find out how, you've got to read A Wanted Man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.